Well, okay, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to, uh, this is Guarantee RV, right? Yes. Yeah. Same as it was yesterday. Yeah, uh, let's see. It's been a while. This is June, and we're trying to do one of our seminars. My name is Dan Edgecombe. I work at Guarantee. I'm not quite sure what I do. This is Dave Taylor. Good morning. He is our service director extraordinaire. Uh, we are doing a seminar this morning on uh, basic RVs. Uh, it's just for beginners. Uh, we have a few suggestions and some items here to discuss. Uh, our, our goal here is to provide information. I've done this uh, for quite a while and Dave has done it for quite a while. Between the two of us, we're over 70 years of experience. And this is where Dave says he's only been in a five years. So. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> of course, because um, I'm way younger. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, we're going to start off with uh, talking about batteries and what they're for. And if you people back there have questions, please uh, feel free to, to uh, ask and we'll, we'll get going. In, in our industry, we, we have two different kinds of batteries. We have uh, for towables and motorhomes, the towing vehicle or the engine in the motorhome, that battery is a chassis battery. It's a starter battery for the engine. Uh, it's, it's a very common one. For the house, the box, for the RV itself, we have deep cycle batteries. Deep cycle batteries are designed to be able to discharge a small amount of current over a long period of time. They deep cycle down and then they can recharge again. By design, the frame of those batteries is capable of being discharged over and over again without the frame coming apart. Uh, they use a, a, a metal material instead of a lot of chassis batteries they stamp the plate over cardboard. So when the plate's totally discharged, all there is left is cardboard or some kind of a plastic material that doesn't conduct electricity. So if a chassis battery is totally discharged, there's no metal left for the uh, lead sulfate to recharge itself back to that plate. So if you use a starter battery as a deep cycle, after two or three cycles there's nothing left. They cannot be recharged. You can ruin a chassis battery really fast by letting it go dead. Dave, what is a fully charged battery? 12.6 volts. Okay, for you out in the audience, what is a, the what our industry considers a dead battery? What's the voltage of that dead battery? What, I'm sorry? Zero? No. So a dead battery is? 11 and a half volts. 11 and a half volts. If you look at the potential, let's say that this group 24 flooded cell deep cycle battery is 80 amp hours. That's at 12.6 volts. 12.6 volts. And if you take this down to 11.5 or 6 or whatever, you basically have consumed that 80 amp hours. If you try to take any more power out of it, let's say you're down to 10 volts and you're trying to run the lights and the furnace won't come on, because there's no power, no energy left in that battery. That battery has to be maintained at at least 12 volts. Correct. So a lot of times you plug in and, and it was down around 10 and it jumps right back up to like 12 and a half or 13. And 20 minutes later you unplug it or turn the generator off and it just drops right back down again. That's a surface charge. Surface charge. So these batteries have to be charged. They like to be charged at about a third of their capacity. So if it's 80 amp hours, they want to be charged at 25 or so, 30 amps per hour. So it takes three hours to do a bulk charge. And then you want to let it sit for another hour to let it kind of 
relax and, and float and finish off that charge. So it takes three to four hours to charge a battery. Yes, ma'am. What does a what? What does it run? What does it run? The chassis battery just starts the engine. Just starts the engine? Yeah, well, it, it runs the headlights and the, the some of the dash features and things like that. Most anything it, chassis related. Yeah. Well, in a motorhome, you have, a, I think, a Newmar product. In a motorhome, it gets kind of confusing because half the stuff on the dash is run by the chassis, half of it's run by the coach. Like your infotainment center, uh, I've had this question a hundred times, hey, my backup camera won't come on. They're not turning on their battery disconnect. disconnect. And that, that house battery disconnect is what operates some of the items on your dash, like your backup camera, your infotainment center, your radio, things like that. So anyway, most of the chassis related items are run by the chassis battery. What is it? The, there is no, in a gas motor, there is very rarely a chassis battery disconnect. But all RVs, I don't know about 10 trailers in that, but all, all no. motorhomes and a lot of trailers have house side battery disconnects. And what are those actually for? They're, they're basically for, a lot of people use them for storage. They were uh, invented years ago so that when you're fueling you can walk out of your motor home turn your batteries off so you have no uh, no sparks possible of happening anywhere with refrigerators lighting water heaters lighting it basically disconnects the complete motor home so you're safe safe when fueling or uh, filling propane they are also used by some people if you're going to store them for a short time you can disconnect your battery so there are always parasitic draws on a battery, but this slows the amount of discharge on the battery when storing. And if you leave some lights on, that just shuts it all down? That shuts it all down. Yeah. So yeah. you should have, any time that you're in that coach, using it, cleaning it, whatever, any time you're around the coach, you want to have that battery disconnect turned on. Correct. If you're driving down the road, camping, cleaning, whatever, if, if you're storing it somewhere and you're not going to be going in and out of it, then you go ahead and turn it off. Uh, but the chassis batteries on yours, there is no uh, chassis disconnect. On some of the Highline diesel motorhomes, they have uh, chassis and house disconnects. Yeah, the, the, they have the Perco switches yep. uh, on the diesel pushers. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what's the... the Okay. You want to explain the group 24 and go up through the uh, yeah. lead acid and then clear up into our new uh, our new big dog batteries? Yeah. yeah. So this is a, in our industry, we call it a flooded cell. It's a wet cell battery. It has lead plates, sulfuric acid, and the chemical reaction is when you have complete a circuit between the posts, then the lead and the sulfuric acid will go to lead sulfate and water and then when you want to recharge the battery you put let's say that you draw the battery down to 12 volts you have to put at least one more volt above that to get over the back emf to recharge it so you'd have to put a 13 volt potential at that battery to bring that battery back up to full charge what you're doing is you're forcing the reaction backwards you're taking that lead sulfate and you're plating that lead back onto the plate. And then what you're left with is sulfuric acid in solution. Now, we, years ago, we started using what they called absorbed glass mat batteries. That's this one. This is a lifeline. This is arguably the best battery on the market for absorbed glass mat. They are very good very durable batteries. Absorbed glass means that there's a fiberglass pouch that they put the lead plate in and they impregnate that pouch with a slurry which is the sulfuric acid, water, and a gelling compound just to hold it in its solution. So these batteries are sealed which means that 
Uh, you, you can't get into them to add water. They don't outgas. Uh, they're a zero maintenance battery. A flooded cell battery uh, on the on the 12 volt side. <coughs> excuse me. You need to check the water level every four to six weeks during times of use. In the AGM absorbed glass mats, you don't ever have to do that. All you do is wipe off the top for to make sure there's no current draw from. Uh, they call it current trail. Yeah, current yeah. rail. Dust, dust particles, anything that possibly could uh, m m touch between the positive and negative yeah. would cause uh, Any kind a parasitic of a, draw. A leak. Yeah. So all you have to do is wipe them off. All you have to do is wipe them off. Yeah. Now, the, the advantage of absorbed glass mat is longevity. Uh, this 12-volt battery, uh, it, it's got a one-year warranty on it. They typically last two to three years. The, uh, the rating of this battery is in duty cycles, which is how much you draw down and recharge and how many times you can do that. Uh, the duty cycles on, on these 12 volt interstates is, I think, of 175, 180 uh, on average, not a lot. You get into the 6 volt, which is this size right here, uh, that, the duty cycle is over twice that. They, the flooded cell can discharge, recharge over 300 times. Now in the AGM, now you're getting 6, 700, 800 in the, in the duty cycle. They can discharge, recharge, discharge, recharge, and they, they stand up better. When we start talking about big inverters and solar panels, this is the battery so far of uh, of choice because it is so much more durable. It can handle the deep cycle and, and do a much better job. Of course, they are a little bit more money. The interstate six volt. I don't didn't bring one, but uh, this it's this size. It's just green. Uh, those are like 150 or 160 bucks somewhere in there, and uh, they last three to four years. I've heard more, I've heard less, it's just they're a high maintenance, so it just depends on how you maintain them. On the absorbed glass mat, they'll last six, eight, ten years. And it's all how they're taken care of, how, how they're abused or neglected. They can stand uh, uh, being dead for a few weeks, but zero charge in them. Uh, you can do that a few times where it'll kill a regular battery. Uh, but these things, their duty cycle is again, six, eight hundred cycles. Four times that, two to three times that of a flooded cell six volt. They last a lot longer. Uh, they don't need to be ventilated where a flooded cell battery uh, needs to be ventilated so the installation can be uh, a lot simpler. The latest thing that we've been kind of playing with it, and before this uh, lockdown, um, we were really starting to get into it. It kind of dried up the industry for a while, but we're going to get back into them. This is a lithium ion, uh, and there's there's four kinds of lithium ion. In our industry, we we use the lithium ferrous ion uh, batteries, and if you were to take this apart, it's it's interesting. Uh, You'd think it's like a, a lead plate or something like that in there, but what it is is a bunch of capacitors and a printed circuit board and per cell. And, and all this is is capacitors with a printed circuit board that tells the capacitors when to discharge. And we have found that uh, the, the best ones, uh, they're a little bit more money, but they're much better quality made. Uh, and, and I think that uh, the price has come down. We were just looking at some Battleborns. Uh, they're out of Salt Lake City, I believe. Uh, and, and they're retailing, they used to be $1,600, and they're now retailing uh, this last spring when we were looking at it. They were retailing for 1000 And, uh, you know, that's almost something that we would jump on. And the reason why we like that, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we sell a lot of large high-end coaches that have that are all electric, and the people want to be able to dry camp with their household refrigerator, 
uh, we put in large inverters and large solar arrays and battery banks. Some of our high-end coaches are coming with six, eight, and then the King Airs come with 16 uh, batteries. So we've done quite a few solar upgrades with a big inverter to run these refrigerators dry camping, and we require usually five or six 170 watt panels. And we were putting in six or eight batteries of the uh, absorbed glass map. And one time this guy wanted the lithium ion, and he said, just put in two, because they were, they were, they were, they were $1,200 at that point. And it was amazing to us to see that those two batteries actually performed as good as four of these. And, and what it happened, the way these do it, it's interesting. And, and if you have a cordless drill that's, that's a lithium battery, this thing will go the same voltage, full power, till it's done and then boom, it's done. It just, it goes, uh, the output of this is like 12.6 or 12.7, then it drops down to like 12.3, 12.4, and it'll stay there for the, the, the charge of that battery. And then when it gets down to where it's discharging the last uh, capacitor, it drops from 12.3 or whatever, boom, zero. Zero. I mean, when you're dead, you're dead. But in, in the case of supplying an inverter, these seem to be able to, at the same rated capacity of 100 amp hours, they seem to be able to do much better because of that kind of output, where even the lithium or even the AGMs from Lifeline, those will, uh, they'll start out at, at 12 and a quarter, and they keep going down until they hit 11 and a half. So the power you're getting out down here isn't equal to the power up here. These have the same potential output all the way across the board. And, and to us, that's been the really the, the, the kicker. But they are quite a bit of money. I would like to add that after you watch this, don't, don't run out and just buy some of these offline and throw them in your 2012 motorhome. They do require, depending on the year of your converter or your inverter, we have to possibly upgrade the charge side of that unit also to accept these batteries. A lot of the newer converters in the last year or two uh, have a stamp right on them that say lithium acceptable or used with lithium. Uh, they do charge at a different rate, so uh, don't, you know, take, if you don't want to do it here, Go somewhere where they actually do know their lithium batteries and realize that they charge at a higher rate, so your converter may have to be changed out also. Sorry, I just want to put no, that in. No, that's fine. And tell them about the alternator. Is that takes a that you were you were the one that was telling me about that little charger that goes with the alternator. Because yes, they did. They do have a kit also if it's in a motor home if you're going to charge while you're driving. Uh, basically, it's a diode pack and converter system that goes in between the alternator and the, ch and the batteries uh, and basically what that's going to stop is any uh, voltage going the wrong direction and causing damage to your charging system as, as in your alternator. So if somebody just says yeah bring it by our shop and we'll put those in you may want to talk to somebody that actually does lithium installs and is, is up on how it is to be done the proper way. What's happening when you have when you're charging one of these batteries, these capacitors are controlled by these, this printed circuit board. So the alternator is putting out current to this battery, and then the printed circuit board says, oops, we're full, we're done, and it cuts off that current immediately. And uh, the chassis manufacturers are worried about the spike in the alternator. Right. So this controller of yours that has the capacitors that absorb that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, keeps, it keeps any weird fluctuations of electricity going either direction and hurting any part of your RV. Now, a couple caveats, if I might. Um, Dave Taylor has been saying for years that uh, if you have a battery bank, let's say you just have two batteries or you have four, um, 
wherever she went. <laughs> uh, anyway, if one of them goes bad, while it was going bad, it was breaking the other battery. So if you have one go bad, you've got to replace them all. Yep, they're always best to replace them as a whole set. If one of these starts having a problem, the better ones, uh, like uh, the Battleborn, and uh, we have one other one in here that was that way, you could take it apart and uh, you could replace the diode pack that is defective. And it, ostensibly, you could keep using that same battery. Uh, they don't have a year, they, they have like a six year warranty or something like that, right? Right. But they don't really know how long they'll last because they've only been out a few years. But the projected is 10 to 15 to 20 years. They just don't know. Yeah. But thousand bucks, four and a quarter, yep. and 150. So you, you blow your wad on batteries once, or you do it a couple times, or you do it every two or three years. Uh, these don't take any maintenance whatsoever. That one, the six volt golf cart battery, you've got to maintain it every two or three weeks. You've got to keep that keep water. Keep your eye on it. Yeah, we were working on a coach this morning. Uh, the Dometic awning, uh, the power awning, wasn't working right. And uh, the second thing the tech did was plug it in because there was no power. And he popped the tops on the 12 volt batteries, and there was no water in them. They were totally dry. So, <coughs> replace the batteries. All it works just fine because now the uh, converter has enough power to operate that awning correctly. Yep. You, you, you need to maintain your your batteries. Now, the problem if you kind of hit and miss, once that water level drops down to where it's exposing the plate, that lead turns gray because it's changed into lead oxide. And lead oxide will not react with uh, the sulfuric acid. That part of that lead plate is, is dead. It's, it's gone. So if you boil out your battery three quarters away and you fill it with water, you think you're fine, only a quarter, if you're lucky, is going to work. So you got to maintain them, and if, if you're the kind of person that only maintains your water level in your martini, you need to look at some of these, because those are going to kill you. Yep. And they I are agree. the heart of your RV. With that, I think I've talked enough for a while. Okay, uh, well, I'm going to go over to plumbing. That's kind of where I kick in. Dan amazes me every time we do this with his knowledge on batteries. I think we've done... 20 or 30 of these together over the years yeah. and yeah. Or possibly more and I still can't remember all that stuff. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go right into uh, plumbing. Water tank and water pump. Let's kind of go over a water pump. If you have your frame rail here and your fresh water tanks underneath that. <coughs> Excuse me. Somewhere below the frame rail or above, you're going to have this little water pump. Then somewhere up here on top of a shelf, or excuse me, a counter, you're going to have you a faucet. Not the greatest faucet. I, I didn't do well in uh, art class, sorry. He went for the girls. So, well. Okay, so you're going to have water in here. What's going to happen is this is going to come up, your plumbing, and go to your water pump. Then it's going to go right up here, among other places, it's going to go to your faucet. So off this water pump, you're going to have your two wires that are going to go up to your switch. So when you're dry camping and you flip this switch on, this water pump's going to turn on. It's going to grab this water out of your holding tank, force it up to your faucet, and that's how you have water to your faucet. That's why when you turn it on, it's going to lose this pressure, and it's just going to continually pump water up. So when you go to a park where you don't want to use your water heater, you go to the nice fancy park where they got washing machines in the little house, and you plug in, you got 50 amp service, cable, and all that. What they do out here on the post where they have the, the little water spigot coming out, you hook your hose up, 
It's going to go to a hookup on the side of your RV that goes in line upstream. of your water pump. So it's going to get plumbed right in here. In turn, what you can do at that point is turn your water pump off because what's supplying the pressure is your city water pressure or well water pressure, whatever, wherever you're getting your water from. We have a lot of people that call and say they run both. There's absolutely no reason to. If you do, the only thing keeping this city water pressure from going back into this tank are the valves on the end of this pump, the pump valves that pump this water one direction. If you have city pressure here and this pump's here and they're both going at the same time, not only is the water being pumped up to your faucet, it can back bleed into your fresh water tank. So we get a lot of people call and say, for some reason I have water coming out my overflow in my water tank. First thing we say is, do you have your water pump on and hooked to city? And usually it's yes. So we like people to know, you use one or the other, you don't need both. Also with saying that, even if you don't have the water pump on, uh, there are contaminants that get into your water system. Dust, dirt, uh, you wouldn't believe what comes, depending on where you're at. Further south you go, the water gets a little worse. So the best thing you can do to start off with is get a filter of some sort. Even if you can't afford the big thousand dollar system, Anything to stop the big chunks from getting in there helps. Because we also get calls that say, I don't have my water pump on, I'm hooked to city, and my fresh water tank is overflowing. Might be just dripping heavy, but it's overflowing. So what happens is on the end of this, if you're looking at the end of the water pump, there's usually three to four rubber valves, rubber discs, that go up and down in a cylindrical motion to pump this water, science, science stuff. Engineers did this to us. What happens is this little speck of dirt, when you shut it off, got stuck between one of these little flapper valves and the seat, allowing water to go from here back into that tank. So if that happens, run your water pump a little while and see if you can get that little chunk of dirt out. If not, at that point, that little chunk of dirt has cracked or split or put a hole in one of these little flapper valves. At that point, it's new water pump time. So the best thing you can do is get that water partially clean before you get it into the motorhome. You got any questions on water pumps? Or my diagram actually looks pretty good today. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. All makes and models have some kind of a water pump switch to turn it on and off. Some have one, some have two, some have three. In the same place though? Oh, no, it depends on where the manufacturer put it in the unit. Some are in the bathroom, some are on the kitchen over the vent fan, uh, some are on the main monitor panel, just wherever wherever the, your manufacturer mounted it. So now we're going to go right to uh, the poop. But well, we're, we're going to go to holding tanks. Um, sometimes the gray is worse than the black. Uh, for all of you out there, um, I'm just going to say this because some people don't know. The black tank is sewage. The uh, gray tank is showers and sinks. Uh, what we get a lot on black and gray tanks are uh, they've only, somebody's only used it six or eight months. They, they've used their unit quite often, but they've only had it six or eight months, so to them it's new. So what happens is they will call and they'll ask Dan, hey, we dumped our tank after camping, and our monitor panel up here that has all these fancy lights on it has a, a full and uh, let's, let's go two-thirds and a third, and empty. So, and Dan tells him, well, have you used Happy Camper? Happy Camper is a cleaner that needs to be installed in your tank between uses and all and during uses, and I'll explain it in a minute. And they say, well, no, we haven't done that. Uncle Bob told us we didn't have to. He uses ice. 
he uses ice or something different. So Uncle Bob's wrong. What's in the side of this tank are these probes. You're going to have a full one and your two thirds and your third and then you're empty. And what this looks like almost is like the end of a pencil, uh, the eraser end of a pencil. Six in about a half inch. It's not super sharp. However, off these are a bunch of wires that come up to a resistor pack. That resistor pack reads the resistance off of these probes. So as the water or sewage comes up, it can tell and it sends all these wires up to the different places here to make those lights light up. Am I right so far? Um, Dave Taylor yeah. told me that, yeah. So what happens is you're out there camping, you go up to Diamond Lake trout fishing, you got a bunch of sewage floating around in here, and right here you got one of these dudes floating around. Yeah. Well, that's a turd. So it's not a Snickers bar. It's not because you've only been there two or three days. It hasn't had a hundred percent chance to be dissolved. That comes in with the happy camper in a little bit. So what happens is you're taking corners down off Highway 58 to come to town. You go to dump it and you dump it. Well, while you're dumping it, this little dude flies over here and sticks itself right on that probe. So successfully, you've harpooned a turd right there. Well, since this works on resistance, this one will light up this one. In turn, this one will light up this one. They work in a, a stair-step action. Since this is on there, this is showing a resistance. So, of course, it's showing that you're a third full. You're not really a third full. You're empty. You just have some crud in there. In order to get rid of that crud, we're going to go to Happy Camper in a minute, and I'll explain that. So, what you have to do with these systems is keep these probes as clean as possible. The only way to do that is for rinsing, washing them out, draining them. The best secret is, and I go to Happy Camper, anybody you talk to is going to have their own, what they use, their secret solution. All I can tell you is I've been here going on 13 years, and when I started here, I'd never heard of this. And it's not one of those blue dyes or green powders you stick in that makes it smell like flowers, so when you're in the bathroom, it smells like green flower poop. This actually takes the smell out of your sewage tanks. It takes the smell out, and it's an active enzyme that actually starts to eat away at what's in there. Not only the stuff floating, but the stuff on the walls of your tank. So the best thing to do is get you a little bucket, put you a scoop or two in here, and all the directions are on the back. It is a powder, so you don't just want to dump it down the uh, uh, toilet. You can actually test this. If you take some of this and put it in a coffee, a paper coffee cup, put about a quarter of a scoop, put a little water in there, you'll feel the water get warm. So. You want to mix this up in about a gallon or two of water, stir it up, get it all dissolved, pour it down in your black tank. What that does is pre-loops your tank for your next camp out. As you're using it, everything's dropping into this happy camper and starts eating it off. If you've got to the point where you haven't used this and you have this up there, you're going to need to take two, three, four scoops of this, mix it up real well, dump it in there, fill your tank, let it sit two or three, four days, take it down, dump it again. And usually, the first or second time you do that, it'll all start reading right again. It's also to be used in your gray tank. Uh, a lot of people think gray tanks are just shower water and sink water. What's too bad with those? Except the bacon you cook, the fried eggs, the, the oil off your body, out of your hair, the little specks of rice aroni off your dinner plate all goes down in your gray tank. That's a waste. And when it gets down there, it starts to mold, mildew, smell. Uh, you need to get that happy camper in there to keep everything clean, keep it off the sides, probes clean. You'll never have a problem with probes if you use this 
starting at day one and use it as you're supposed to all the time. I've, I've seen that happen. Okay, Dan, where are we? I'd like to go over water heaters. Yeah, I was going to go get the room. Okay, good. I love to burn up this paper. I'm going to go over a real quick thing with water heaters. The kind kind of goes along with your filter. Particulates can get in your system. Um, e even if you have a filter, you're going to have little stuff. You're going to have hard waters, calcium, stuff like that. So a water heater is basically a round tube. It has a square styrofoam box on it. But your water all comes in and out of that unit. So at least once a year, on the outside of your water heater, you will see a drain plug. What happens is that drain plug is a couple inches off the bottom of your water heater. So in turn what happens is this water that's in here, even if, after, if, you, winter, if you dump your tanks, <coughs> drain your system, this water stays in here. So any particulate that makes it into this water heater finds its way to the lowest end of that water heater, which is right down in here. So it starts building up. What will happen is this hot water, when it gets down in there and mixes all this up, it will start to stink. It will stink like sulfur. Uh, my grandparents had a farm years ago, and when you took a shower, you could smell it in the water. It was just their pump water. In an RV, when you start getting stinky water, the main place is right here in the water heater. So once a year, we take that plug out, and we take a water heater washout tool that has a valve on it, hooks on your hose. You're going to pull that plug out. You put this in there, turn the hose on. Stand to the side. Stand to the side, because there's going to be a lot of water coming out. Uh, you will be surprised what comes out of the bottom of your water heater. So by doing that, you're not only going to freshen your water, clean your water, um, you're, you're, you're going to increase the life of your water heater by years. Is there a certain pressure in your hose? Much as, you, as much as you can get. From the state? Yep. Yeah, there's, this hole is so big and that thing's so small that Whatever, however much pressure you can get in there, the better. These these systems are designed for 60 psi, and they can handle 80. And so any garden hose is going to be uh, not not a threat. Yeah, not for that. Mm -hmm. um, dumping your tanks. If you're going to dump your black and gray tank, um, you're always best if you have time to dump your black and gray tank. And then if you're somewhere where you have time, it's always best to close the valve, go back inside, put some more fresh water in it, and dump it a second time. Because what happens is uh, some of that sludge and sewage that's in that tank, when it rushes out the, uh, the exit at the valve, not all of it makes its way out. You always have some stuff in there. Uh, the best thing to do is try to get fresh water back in there, get some pressure behind it to walk the rest of it out. Okay, what are you going to go to, Dan? That kind of looks well, like appliances. Yeah, I wanted to touch on, uh, uh, you kind of mentioned it, but I wanted to talk about this a little bit. filter, you go right ahead. Yeah, um, this is one of my things. So, I get a lot of questions on this, how to, you know, <coughs> filter your water coming in. I recommend these highly. This is... Not necessarily this one. There's several like that. This, this is designed as a whole coach filter. Uh, this little hose right here, uh, you hook this on to the hose bib, and then you hook this to this, and it takes the strain off the end of this filter, and then your hose go, goes over to your coach. This is going to just get the big chunks out. It's not going to get the small particulate and not going to get Montezuma's revenge or any of that, but it'll get the big chunks out. And the reason you want something like this is because the 
the fine filters that you put in these type of canisters, they fill up really fast. And, and people ask me all the time, well, how often do I change my filter? And the answer is, is when the water flow slows down, because that's when this is full, or one year. And you just don't want to let this sit in the coach hooked up. In the fall, when you're done, and you go to winterize it, if you bring it to us, we're going to take the filter out and set it in the sink. And we don't throw it away so that you have it there to get the, to match it to a new one next spring. You don't leave it in the coach. If you use one of these, when the water flow slows down, throw it away. But it'll, it'll take a lot of the sulfur and a lot of the bigger chemicals out. And it's, it's, they're a good thing. These, we mount these, you can either put this inside your wet bay or you can put it on a little rack and stand it out beside. The advantage to this is you can go to different kinds of filters. You can have a coarse granular filter and you can have a very fine carbonaceous filter that will take out everything. But again, the finer the filter, the faster it gets clogged up. So if you're, people used to go to Mexico all the time. You just don't hear that much anymore about going to Mexico. But down there in the, the southern states, Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico, there's enough in the water that you, you really need to use these. And you start out with one of these to get the big chunks out, and then one of these to get the finer material out. You can go through one of these a week. Uh, I have people tell me that all the time. Now this one, a lot of times, instead of having it in a wet bay or wherever, they'll just have one faucet that they super clean. And, and a lot of times we'll put a inline filter similar to this under the kitchen sink. So you have this one outside for the big chunks, and then you have one under the kitchen sink only for maybe the cold water line and so that it's not a high volume situation, but it's a, a good, safe thing to do. Highly recommend these. These are, these are designed, you buy the first one with the hose and then you can buy refills and they're less than 20 bucks a piece. They're not that bad. That's what I use, the small one. Yeah. I have a question. In Arizona, the water is so heavily laden with sulfur that it corrodes everything. Yeah. This, that will prevent the corrosion from the salt going into your, going into your water tank? I think I'm understanding your question right about the salts in there. Uh, this will take a lot of the big chunks out, but salts are in solution. They're not little particles floating along. They're actually in solution. They're dissolved in it. So then you have to have a water softener. And water softeners, they, they use chemistry to change the pH of the water so that these salts that are dissolved settle out. And that's, that's chemistry. This is just a filter. And, and the dissolved salts, these won't touch those. Uh, because that the dissolved salts are, are tied to the water molecule itself. And they're too small uh, for any of the filters. The, 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 the crud, the Montezuma's revenge and all of that are bigger molecules and they can be caught in the carbon, you know, uh, filters of these. But anything that is a salt is dissolved in it. You have to have the softener. And there are some good softeners. We sell one, it's like 300 bucks. And you have to load it and, you know, do, you know, as you do as a home water softener. And, and but that's using chemistry. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Kind of. I know it's awfully, the water is just so full of yeah. salt that it leaves a salt corrosion crust. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. We, we get coaches back from California south, in the south, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, all the time. And it's so bad that the faucets won't work. And the P-traps and the filters and the, you know, the aerators, they're all clogged up. And, and we've had them so bad. I had a Holiday Rambler once. It was so bad that you, you'd take the fittings apart and it'd be full of these crystals. And 
in these water heaters, you get coarse granules of that because it settles out after a while. And, and, and you get handfuls of this stuff. And a, a matter of fact, I have a... Uh, Tupperware full. Yeah, yeah, Tupperware full of stuff. Looks like my mom's oatmeal, and my mom made the worst oatmeal in the world. But uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so anyway, it's two different situations. Um, appliances, I, I, I don't have much to I'll do. I'll go off on appliances. I wanted to talk about the uh, spring tune-up, but if you... We'll keep doing to... it. Okay. I don't want to interrupt you. You're on a roll. Well, I had a donut. Oh, God, you're Not on a roll. Yeah. I had a donut. No, I'm sorry. That... I have to be honest. I had a donut. Anyway, um, I, I, this, these little seminars that we give are not for us to sell product to you. This is for us sharing our information. But we do, and I'm sure that there's a lot of other dealerships that do this. We do what we call a spring tune-up. And if it gets into summer or fall or winter, we call it a winter tune-up or whatever. We have a tune-up. It, it's two hours of tech labor. It's, our techs get 130, well, they don't, but the, the, our shop rate's 137 an hour. Our spring tune-up, and it's still spring, barely, uh, is $100, $99 at the end. And it's two hours of, of tech time, and we go through all your systems and your, 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 your plumbing, your electrical, your 110, your 12 volt. It goes through the appliances, and we, we clean the burner on the refrigerator, and we clean out the, the water heater, don't we? Yep. Um, and, and one of the really important things we do is the LP system. My house out here, a couple miles out into the farmland, I have natural gas. So it's all plumbed. The house was built in the 50s, and we've never had the LP system tested for leaks because my house has never gone anywhere. But in an RV, you're constantly moving it. It's shifting, driving, people walking around, and, and these systems flex a little bit. So, number one, the, the government says that if you sell a coach, whether you're a private owner or a dealer, you must do an LP system test. A lot of times, people buy things from private parties. It doesn't happen, so I try to tell them, hey, you need to have your LP system tested because you could be going along totally unaware of the fact that you have an LP leak until it's too late. So we do these spring tune-ups, and one of the things we do is the LP system test. What we do is we test, we, it's called a drop-down test. You put a little pressure in it, and then you bleed it off so both sides of the regulator are the same pressure. In other words, it's less than the, the working pressure. And then you watch that pressure to make sure that it doesn't drop over a period of, it used to be 12 minutes, I don't know, 10 minutes. We go five minutes now. Five minutes now. If you don't have that drop, then your system is intact. You should do that once a year. And uh, whether you have a new coach or not, because you're using it, you're flexing. We do everything that we sell, whether it's wholesale or retail. Uh, that's one of the many things that we test. It's a very good thing. We also do a free roof inspection, and we tell you, okay, your furnace has got problems, but this is where we're at. Uh, we don't repair anything, but it's it's a very inexpensive way to really find out where your coach is at, and it does the LP system, and we clean the burners, and, and that's a good thing. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. You had a couple things you want to talk about appliances? Just about appliances, just as far as keeping them clean. Uh, every spring you should uh, take your outside door off your refrigerator on the exterior, make sure no squirrels or mice have gotten there, and put in any nests. Uh, just clean it out. If you have a little compressor, maybe blow it out. You want to keep the dust and dirt out. Um, as far as water heaters, we went over keeping those clean. And uh, furnaces, there's not a lot you can do with a furnace, except if you have a compressor, you can blow a little compressed air into the intake and exhaust. Um, cleanliness is a great thing in an RV, especially with electronics. So uh, keep them clean. Okay, you want me to go into roof sales?
Yeah, you want maintenance? to start? Maintenance? Yeah. Okay. Okay, roof seals. We're going to go over maintenance. Roof sealants. I'll do the roofs and sealants. He does, he's good at chassis because he gets on a kick about tires and away we go. So, all sealants on an RV are different than you're going to have for a house. Uh, don't let Uncle Bob again tell you he uses liquid nails to seal the skylight. That is not what we use. We use a product called Dicor. It's a lap sealant, self-leveling. Um, there are two or three others out there. If you go to a place that's reputable and ask them what to use, they should show you. This is a self-leveling. Uh, it's a real gooey. This is not something you're going to want to get your fingers in. But this is going to cover... Uh, basically just about every RV out there has a self-leveling sealant on top. What you're going to look for on the roof is cracks in your existing sealant. Uh, Dan had mentioned a free roof inspection. Uh, most places should. If they don't, we do a free roof inspection where if you come in, we'll look at it, take pictures, give you an idea what's going on, and you can, uh, if you wish, we'll sell you the stuff and you can do it yourself or we can. So you're going to look for little cracks in your existing sealant. And those can show up any time within about six months after you purchase the unit. Most manufacturers cover sealants for uh, 90 days. Some do for a year. You have to look into that and see what your unit has covered. If you have little cracks starting in that sealant, uh, it is a pliable sealant. So what you can do to get by for the first couple, two or three years of ownership is get some kind of a, a a degreaser and take a rag up there with you clean that area really well with an acetone or degreaser and then you're gonna lay this over top of those cracks and you can do this like I say for two or three years depending on where you live everybody thinks uh, uh, you know water's their biggest enemy and usually it's sun so you're gonna want to keep an eye on that Put it over the cracks, do that every four or five months. Just be careful if you're up on the roof. Now, we do not use this for side sealants, around windows, around doors, anything on the sides, front or rear. This, we, would, we use a ProFlex. There's other, there's Parbon, there's ProFlex. There's different colors, there's white, there's clear. I think they even have gray now. So, this is not as drippy. It is twice as sticky. So you want to make sure when you're uh, putting this on, you're wearing gloves because this stuff is hard to get off your fingers once it gets on there. I've been doing this long enough. I probably still some, have some on my fingers. So make sure you go somewhere that's going to give you the right product. We, bathroom caulk, silicone, door and windows, uh, DAP sealants. That is all household style. It does not work on RVs. Don't let anybody sell you silicone for an RV. That should not be put on an RV. There are, there are proper products, and most places sell it. Am I good? You want to throw, throw I, know, I can tell you're waiting to throw something in there. Well, I was just going to explain that part. Um, About the silicone and yeah. the reverse. Yeah. Yeah. This is so, where the science comes in, and he's the science guy. So, <laughs> okay. So the, the reason that we are really pushing very specific <coughs> sealants and cleaners. There's what's called a carrier solvent in this sealant. The carrier solvent keeps this liquid, but it also is designed to etch into whatever it is you're going to be sealing. So when you caulk it out, it kind of grips into it. It chemically bites into it. So if I was to go to Jerry's because I thought I'd save myself, this is twelve dollars. Oh shoot, I can go get some stuff at Jerry's for two ninety nine. The problem is, is as soon as I caulk out that dap, the carrier solvent in that is going to start destroying that rubber roof because the carrier solvent will, when it etches into it, it'll just—it's too strong. It's designed for wood and brick and things like that. The same thing, you don't want to use something like WD-40 or something. It looks nice, but it leaves a residue. And the residue gets in the way of the sealants. So you're, you're going to pay a little bit more 
for, for RV specific materials, but you're going to get a four, five, ten times the job because they're what is designed by the manufacturers. This is the company that actually makes the rubber that's on your roof, and they are intended specifically for those units. Yep. Um, that's that's all I had to say. The last thing about the roof, though, I'd like to talk about. This. Yep, I figured I'd let you go on that. So, at first I thought this was kind of a sham deal, but then I played with it online. I was very impressed. When when you've had your RV for a year or so, you start getting these gray streaks down the sides and the white streaks. The gray streaks are what they call industrial fallout. It's pollution. The white streaks are. Uh, the pigment from the rubber itself, because rubber's black, and your roof is some shade of white or light brown or something. Uh, we had bounders for a while, they were almost pink, kind of a purpley color. But anyway, that, that's, that pigment sheds off out through the years. So what this stuff does is you go up there with your pressure washer and keep it low pressure and the nozzle about a foot off and just rinse it off really good. And when you're done sealing and it's dry, you just mop this on. And it's like putting floor wax down. You get it on everything and it, it dries out. The only caution is, is once you've done that and you're, you're out there a week later and you want to get up on the roof and it's been raining and that roof is wet, don't go because this, with it, it's wet, this stuff is slick. And you don't want to be going on your roof when it's wet but it will protect that membrane. It'll keep the, the pigment from shedding off. It'll enhance the life uh, of the sealants, and it, it just does a good job. It did very good stuff. I highly recommend it. It's about $30, $35 a gallon. A person can do it themselves. One gallon will do a 30-foot 30, 30 motorhome or trailer. That's about it for me. Okay, well do you want to go and finish off the chassis then? Okay. As far as tires and um, stuff? Yeah, all we've usually been talking about is um, with the new oils. This is something we've been talking about a bit on our end of it. Um, Ford has, has been going for 5,000 miles and they're starting to talk about 7,500. They use a synthetic uh, motor oil and we do a lot of Ford chassis and we will only use the Ford oil period again it's more money it's by the court everybody sells it you don't have to go to Ford to buy it but it's a very specific oil for their engines their gaskets their seals all of that stuff they're, they're exceptional oil but the the materials they put in there are, are designed for their engines. And every 5,000 or once a year has been where we are at. I mean, even if, if we bought a 2020 or a 2021 and they're starting to say 7,500 miles, we're still at 5,000. We're not quite ready to move on yet. Now, if you have a diesel pusher, Diesel pushers have a lot of different engines, and it's, it's we're starting to see 15,000 to be uh, quite common. Uh, it used to be 10, uh, and and depending on the some of the big ones, there the bigger engines have 35, 45 quarts of oil in them, and so they're upwards of 25,000 miles per interval. So. Um, you just really have to look at your owner's manual anymore to see when you're due and stick to it. Uh, it's very important to have, you don't just go buy the oil and slide under it and do it anymore because you have to document an oil change. Because if something happens to that motor in three or four years, it's still under warranty and they may question whether you've been maintaining it and what you've been maintaining with and so you need to have that done somewhere. Uh, Freightliners right down the road. Uh, as far as transmissions, uh, the Ford transmissions, uh, every 25,000 to do a, a flush. 
uh, as far as the uh, Allison transmissions, uh, we don't do them. You, you take them to either Cummins Freightliner or Allison, but Allison is in bed with Cummins and Freightliner, so you, one of the two places, or over to Cat sometimes. Um, every 50,000 is when you change the filter and one quart of uh, the fluid. You do not do a service on that transmission until 200,000 miles. You leave it alone, and you do not do it. Uh, that's a ten or twelve thousand dollar transmission. They're very expensive. Um, the last thing that I like to talk about is is tires. Uh, a lot of times, people their first coach they buy is used, and the used car salesman got it on his lot. Yeah, it's great. Look at those beautiful tires. The problem is uh, that coach is twelve years old. Those ba those tires are probably thirteen, maybe fourteen years old. And in our industry, our tires don't wear out, they age out. So when you get to be eight to nine years, that tire is aged out. What happens is these cords sit, and you get a flat spot. You, you start up the motor and you go down the road and it's like this. And pretty soon it's like this, and then boom, you blow a tire. So when you're looking at a coach, a used coach, or you're, you want to use coach, there is a date code on the side of that tire. And that date code, okay. and it has, has four numbers. And if you bring it into us, especially for a spring tune-up, or if you bring it to me, I can go out and look. Those four numbers give you the, the year and the month. So that could be the 14th year and the 17th month, or week, I'm sorry, week. not yeah. month, week. So you've got to be less than nine years. If you buy a used coach and that is a 12-year-old tire, those things are, are legally defective then you need to change those tires. We have trailers that sit for years. And if you have a tire, a tire that sits for over two years, you should replace it because the flat spot doesn't go away. And they lose tire pressure and there's other issues. Um, we have, uh, through the years, Dave and I have seen this a thousand times, Guy goes on vacation, he hasn't used it in three years, he gets in there and he's headed to Yellowstone Park. Gets about 20 miles, blows a tire, he's got a spare. Gets another 50 miles, blows another tire. 50 miles, blows another tire, and then the fourth one, he blows the side of his trailer off. These tires are old, they've been set in one position for so long, they can't flex, and you get a soft spot, you just rip them to shreds. And we see that a lot. Tires are a bit of money, but you're worth a lot more than those tires are. So that's my soapbox. It's just, we see it so often. And Quite a bit. It's a lot just, of damage. It's, it's really important. Yes. So many of these tires don't have the right seal on them. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know if you heard her, she said it's important to check the pressure of your tires, and, and yes, that is very true, you have to do that. Um, it, that gets into the tire valve extensions, which we don't do because they just cause leaks, but uh, tire monitors are pretty good. Uh, we don't install them because if you read the installation from the good tire monitor people, they want the customer to do it themselves because it's so easy to do, but it's the programming that you have to do that teaches you how to use your your tire monitor system. Um, they're a very good. They're very good. Yes, thank you. But even if you don't have a tire monitor system, uh -huh. you have pressure gauges. Yeah. And pressure gauges. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That also. No. Uh, Yeah. 
that's true. And as far as performance goes, uh, I don't know why it's even a conversation anymore, but people ask me, how much pressure did I put in my tire? Well, sitting in your driver's seat, there is a data sticker that, that tells you the size and pressure on your tires. I don't care what the side of the tire says. The manufacturer has designed that chassis with that size of tire at a certain per pressure because at that pressure, that's what the pressure is that that tire can carry the load. So the only right answer is you look on that data plate and it'll tell you what the pressures are and that's what you put in your tire. That's all I know. It's all yours. That's all I got. Okay. Why don't you sign us off, Ollie? All right. Well, I want to thank you all very much. I hope it was informative. If you have questions, send me an email and thank the audience for uh, participating. And uh, hopefully this uh, lockdown won't last much longer. Go camping. Yes. We'll Go be here camping. next month. We'll be here next month. And uh, hopefully when this is over, we'll have 20, 30, 40 people sitting here.